There we go. Live. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the, the 19th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, we have, the meeting is now open to the public. Um, some of the members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconference, and our witnesses from the Association of British Insurers will brief the committee via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablet devices, as we know, by press, pressing F4. Um, apologies, we have apologies this morning from Stuart Dixon. Stuart is still um, off ill, so um, I don't think we have any other. Nope, not as far as I'm aware, Chair. Okay. Probably there or here. So um, we have only one item of business this morning, and the papers are available from page four of your pack. Um, so this morning we're having a, a briefing from the Association of British Insurers <clears throat> um, and as I say the clerk's memo is available at page 4. Uh, ABI news release welcoming the UK government back temporary reinsurance scheme is at page 7 and a table of business insurance issues at page 3 of the table papers. Um, welcome to this morning's meeting Alistair Roy Ross who is the Assistant Director Head of Public Policy, Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland Association of British Insurers. Um, welcome to this morning's meeting. Alistair, can you hear us okay? I can indeed, Chair. Um, so, obviously, this is a, an issue that has um, caused, I suppose, dismay and um, perplexed a lot of business owners um, here and probably right across um, Britain and Ireland in relation to... Um, insurance that they thought they had not paying out in the circumstances that we're in um, and I suppose there's a, a real perception there of the um, of intransigence I suppose from the insurance industry um, and a lack of um, willingness I suppose to engage and support business at, at this time um, so I, I would welcome um, a statement from yourself and then we'll open it up to members yeah well thank you very much chair for the invitation to give evidence before you today. Um, I'll, 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 you've offered me about five minutes, so I'm just going to take that to, to set out the, the position as, as we see it, and then happy to take questions, as you say. So the Association of British Insurers is the voice of the UK's lead insurance industry, and that includes long-term savings. We are representing more than 200 companies, which represents about 90% of the UK insurance market and they are helping households and businesses across the country to manage and insure against the risks that they face. In Northern Ireland, insurance supports 5,000 jobs or so across the insurance firms that are based there, the brokers and associated businesses, and that's generating around £539 million a year in gross value added to the Northern Irish economy. At a UK level, the industry supports more than 300,000 jobs across the country, with two-thirds of those jobs based outside of London, and generates more than £29 billion a year for the UK economy. Now, while financial services is a policy area mostly reserved to Westminster, the ABI works with the Assembly, with its members, and with the Northern Ireland Executive on insurance issues and policy issues, including flood risk management and responses to flooding, to road safety, and in particular on young driver safety and civil justice matters, including personal injury law reform. The ABI has been responding to insurance issues raised by the coronavirus and COVID-19 since February, and this has spanned travel insurance for UK citizens returning home, motor and home insurance cover as people adapt to the new work situations, schools insurance for trips which have been cancelled, wedding insurance, pensions and long-term savings implications, health insurance, trade credit insurance, which is an important product supporting Northern Ireland's agri-food sector and other manufacturers, and business insurance, as you mentioned, which I know you want to spend some time on this morning. What I would point out is that insurers have been proactive in announcing commitments on home and motor insurance policies to support their customers, including cover from working from home, changes to motor policies if customers now need to use their vehicles for work purposes, and cover for volunteer drivers supporting the NHS and their communities, whether that's delivering food or collecting medicines for those who are unable to do that themselves. In April, the ABI reached agreement with the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers in Northern Ireland on the handling of claims in the jurisdiction where limitation may be an issue. Now, the purpose of this agreement is to ease the burden on Northern Ireland's courts during lockdown and protect plaintiff's rights while still working towards a settlement of cases where it's possible to get compensation to pay to those who are, are, are awaiting it um, for a, an injury that they've suffered that's not been their fault. 
Um, I mean, as I said, I appreciate you want to talk about business interruption predominantly this morning. Um, standard commercial insurance policies, so these are the type that the vast majority of businesses purchase, cover uh, a wide range of day-to-day -day risks, including damage caused by a fire in the property, a flood in the property, a theft or accidents involving employees. Now, on average, insurers will pay about £7.8 billion each year in business interruption claims, and that's supporting businesses across the UK. However, these standard policies are not designed to provide cover for business interruption due to a pandemic. And unfortunately, only a minority of businesses will have purchased additional levels of cover for pandemics. In evidence to the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, the ABI gave an initial estimate of £1.2 billion, which insurers expect to pay out on claims related to COVID-19. And within that, £900 million of that is estimated to be on business policies, predominantly business interruption. So as the committee will be aware, last month the Financial Conduct Authority, our regulator, announced that it would seek a determination by the High Court in London on the status of business interruption insurance to resolve doubt for businesses who are facing uncertainty on their claims. Last Monday, the FCA updated that and provided uh, further details in the court action, including identifying the representative sample of policy wordings it wants to examine in the test case, insurers that use those wordings and insurers that will participate in the proceedings along with a wider consultation and draft guidance requesting that all firms check their policy wordings against those to be tested. The draft guidance also outlines the FCA's regulatory expectations for insurers when handling business interruption related claims and, and complaints during the test case. Now, I would point out to the committee that the, the FCA's interim chief executive, Christopher Woolard, has commented on this, and I think it's worth reading his quote in full, if I may. So, what he said is that on behalf of the FCA, we have been clear that we believe in the majority of cases business interruption insurance was not purchased to and is unlikely to cover the current emergency. However, there remain a number of policies where it is clear that the firm has an obligation to pay out in a policy. And for these policies, it's important that claims are assessed and settled quickly. There are also some policies where firms may consider there is no doubt about wording and decline to pay a claim but their customers may still consider there is genuine uncertainty about whether their policy provides cover. So insurers are working closely with regulators to make this process a success. We support any process that will provide clarity and certainty for the, the minority of customers who are disputing whether they should be covered. We strongly recommend that every business should check with an insurer or broker to confirm the type of cover that they've purchased. And for valid claims, leading ABI members have agreed a set of claims handling principles to ensure speedy processing, and that includes interim payments. Insurers have been working with business customers during this exceptional period, and they've been very proactive in granting policy extensions and waiving policy restrictions for customers on a range of activities and insurance products. I just finished by saying that I've already met with the chair of the committee in April to discuss her constituents' business insurance issues, and I'd be happy to have similar discussions with any of the other committee members or indeed any other MLAs after this morning's meeting. I'm not able to comment on individual insurance contracts, but for now, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Alistair. Um, obviously, uh, we've always been contacted by businesses who um, believe that they have business interruption insurance, and as far as we are aware, and members can correct me if, I, if I'm um, out of date on this, but none of us are aware of any um, business that has actually um, received um, their insurance payout. So there's a great deal, I suppose, of um, dissatisfaction around it. Um, and it's as if um, insurance companies are, for want of a better word, exploiting ambiguity um, around um, what what is it within the, the policies. Um, and obviously you have highlighted that there are a number of policies where it is clear that um, there is business interruption insurance and those should be paid out. Are you aware of any businesses here in the north that have um, received a payout in terms of their insurance? I'm afraid I don't have access to the little level of information, Chair, in terms of specific firm that have received payouts. That's obviously between their individual insurers uh, and, and, and the companies themselves. What I would say on that point is business insurance is a regulated product, regulated by the FCA, and it's sold on an advised basis. So the majority of businesses will purchase it via an insurance broker or some other qualified advisor or professional. 
and, and their role, the broker, is to work with the, the customer to identify the risks that that business needs to insure and then liaise with a range of insurers to get the best deal for the business. Now, businesses have bought their insurance cover, including business interruption, with the advice of a qualified professional, and they've chosen the level of cover that they want to purchase. They'll then pay a premium, and the insurer will reserve sufficient capital to pay out against these risks insured. As I mentioned earlier, whether it's a, a fire or a flood in the premises or an injured employee or, or whatever. And the insurer will have sufficient capital to pay out against all those risks, even if they all fall due at the same time. What insurers are not able to do is pay out for risks that they've not reserved capital against. And, and, and as the FCA has recognised, in the vast majority of claims, businesses have not purchased cover against the pandemic. Um, now, I appreciate that's a difficult message for, for, for businesses to hear, but that, that is a situation that we're in, that business interruption insurance is a specific product line. I've, I've said at the terms of that earlier. Companies and, and, and businesses have opportunities to purchase additional levels of cover, and some have done that. Some have bought cover for pandemics, and provided they meet the other terms, conditions of the policy, then they should be getting paid out, and they should be getting paid out as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, the situation is, as I've set out, the vast majority of businesses have not taken this level of cover, um, and therefore are unable to claim on it. Yeah, and I suppose even with the, the pandemic insurance, um, what has been um, transpired, I suppose, for a lot of businesses is the way that it is interpreted as being within the premises, and therefore they're not actually getting the, the payout because they, the disease hasn't been found on the premises of the business, despite the fact that they've had to stop trading because of the disease. Um, and we, um, as a committee, had representation from Enterprise NI, um, and I'll just read you a quote from it. It says, businesses we have engaged with feel let down that after paying expensive insurance premium for years, that the one time they need it, they are not. They are getting a sense that insurers are going all out to not pay, not to help, and not to support. Um, and it goes on to say later in the document, the result now is that many businesses have lost count confidence in their insurance provider, and going forward may not see the value in paying for insurance. And obviously, that is not a situation that that we want to be in. But really, the confidence has been very much undermined by the current circumstances. Um, and. Like, I, I know from previous conversations with both yourself and the FCA, you know that there is um, suggestions of how we need to have conversations around um, the the type the confidence in, in the insurance industry in general. Um, but I think that the lack of willingness to engage is um, is really damaging that. Yeah, no, I, I, I listened in and saw the, the evidence that you received from Enterprise NI last month, and I, I, I spoke to Michael McQuillan myself last week, and he, he made a number of similar points to me. So I can, I, I can recognise what you're saying there. I think just to take a step back um, to make a, what is an important distinction, when you talk about pandemic cover, if, if businesses have taken out pandemic cover, and as I said, as long as they meet the other terms and conditions of the policy, they should, they should be getting paid out. Um, some businesses may have taken out infectious disease cover, which would specify an outbreak of the, the disease in the premises. Um, but, but, but as I said earlier, you know, there, there's a big difference between um, the, the standard terms of business uh, insurance cover, or indeed if you, if you purchase cover that includes infectious disease cover, relating to a specific premises, as opposed to a situation where the entire country has been closed down, not because they have COVID-19 in their premises, but because of the public health risk. And so there's that important distinction to be made between the pandemic level of cover and the infectious disease level cover. But you know, I, as I say, I, I recognise the points that you and, and Enterprise and I have made in terms of the, the need for clear communication. That's the, the insurance contracts are binding contracts to legal documents, and that's one of the benefits in going in the FCA rather going to the High Court in London that we will get clarity and certainty within hopefully a matter of weeks as opposed to waiting months or years for individual cases to litigate and go through by which time the business may not be, be able to benefit from any payout that it does get. But it, you know, I, I would refer back to what I said earlier, the FCA has recognised that the vast majority of, of businesses will not be covered. Now that's, that's very unfortunate, that's a really challenging position. Uh, if, if you're one of those businesses affected. But as I said earlier, this is a, a regulated product that is bought on an advised basis. Yeah, um, 
I suppose as well, you, do, you highlighted some, some figures in the course of, of your, your presentation, the 1.2 billion in claims um, that are expected to be paid out, including the 900 million uh, in business interruption insurance. Ha, has, is that money that has been paid out or is that still an ongoing process and, and um, what is expected to be paid out before the end of the year? Well, that, 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 that was in answer to a, a data request from the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee. So it was an, an, an early estimate uh, based on the claims that our members were handling at that time and I think that figure will change over time so that figure was from April um, we've since then had additional data released by the Lloyds of London commercial insurance market and so that initial 1.2 billion figure is probably close to what 1.7 billion now um, and that would take into account some of the larger more specialist risks that the, the Lloyds of London market covers um, I mean, in terms of those 900 million or so, there are claims in hand. Some of them will, will, will have been settled by now, will have been processed quickly and been settled. Others will be in the process of being settled. One of the, the complexities with business interruption insurance is that it relies on quite a high level of information to be submitted by the, the customer in terms of the financial performance over the previous 12 months. There's a lot of management information that needs to go in in order to establish the value or the quantum of the payout they're going to get. But in, be under no doubt, insurers are working absolutely flat out on these claims where they are valid to try and process them as quickly as possible. As I said, a lot of firms are offering interim payments uh, to address the cash flow issue that these businesses are seeing. And they're really working, hard, working as hard as possible in the same situation as everybody else, where they've had to make this significant transition from working in an office to working from different circumstances and homes with the technology and the regulatory requirements and everything else that, that that makes in the businesses. But they are working as hard as they can to resolve these claims and pending the outcome of the legal review that the FCA has brought, there could be additional uh, claims paid to businesses if the, FCA, if the, if the court rules in their favour. So you see where you say in your briefing that insurers pay out 22 million each day to, to firms. So that, that's in a normal year, um, that that's what will be paid out, which is something just over 8 billion. Um, and I suppose considering the, the unprecedented economic circumstances that we find ourselves in, um, that we would be expecting to be paying out much, much more than, than that, or certainly businesses would have expected that their insurance premiums that they have been paying um, would cover them for these circumstances. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean we'll just remind the committee that insurance is a, a contract-based um, policy and you know, it tends to run on an annual basis. Some, some policies can run for longer. So you'll pay and you'll, you'll purchase cover for that 12 month period and then you'll renew or renegotiate or you may move somewhere else to get a better deal and, and, and carry on. Um, in relation to the, the, business, the, the scale of the business interruption payouts, yes, you know, we, would, we would assume that it's going to be much higher than it would normally have been. We don't have the ability to provide information on, on that yet, but to give it some kind of perspective, we, are, we also estimated that travel insurance firms will pay out circa £275 million in claims related to COVID-19. Now, obviously, the nature of this is that these have really been triggered over the last kind of quarter or so, the last three or maybe four months from Feb February until now. To put that in context, the previous record payout for travel insurance was in 2010, which was the year of a lot of travel disruption due to the ash cloud uh, that prevented international flying. Um, the, the, the total claims for that year was um, £148 million and that was over a 12-month period. What we're looking at now for travel insurance alone is a 275 million payout, as I said, over three or four months in total. So it's too early and it's too difficult to extrapolate out what the impact would be in business and interruption insurance. And as I say, business interruption is a product that does pay out. It's paid out in the past to the tune of, as you, as you said, almost eight billion pounds, and insurers continuing to do so. Uh, in addition to the claims in relation to COVID-19, insurers are still paying out on claims that are made by businesses where they have had the kind of perils I mentioned earlier, but also to businesses that have been affected by flooding. 
um, in the floods earlier on this year, and also to homes and properties uh, that were affected by storms, Kira and Dennis and Horgie in particular. So the, the insurers continue to pay out, but there are challenges where businesses have not bought the level of insurance that would give them cover for a pandemic situation such as we're in just now. I'm going to bring in some other members here. Um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Alistair, for your presentation. I think we're, you know, very concerned about the uh, the lack of responsibility taken by insurers in supporting our businesses. The committee clerk has provided us here with evidence of about 21 businesses, mainly in the hotel and hospitality sector, who have not uh, been able to uh, get access to their claims for insurance cover during the pandemic. Do you have any idea of the value of premiums that you've paid out in Northern Ireland uh, relating to the pandemic since this issue started in February of this year? Thank you very much. I had actually meant to, to say earlier in, in response to the Chair that if you are able to share details of some of the particular situation and cases that you've mentioned, um, that are being brought to you. I'm, I'm certainly have to, happy to have a look at those and treat them as constituency casework or whatever uh, and do my best to assist with those. So if you have got details of these 21 yeah. firms, if, if that's something that you are able to share with me, um, then, then I'll certainly take a look at that. Yeah, I'm sure the Unfortunately... Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, at this point in time, we aren't able to break down the data that we hold on a... Uh, devolved nations basis, so I can't do this for Northern Ireland, I can't do it for Scotland, I can't do it for Wales, um, and, and, and I can't do it for England either. The, the data that we hold is, is at a UK um, level at the moment. So I'm not able to go into the, the level either of the, the payouts or indeed the, the, the premium that's been raised from, uh, from businesses in Northern Ireland. I mean, what, I, what I would point to is that it's a competitive market, there are a number of firms in the market. As I said earlier, it's a, an ad, product sold on an advised basis. So most businesses will be going through a broker who should be going out and getting the, the best possible package. Now, that package shouldn't just be reliant on price alone. Um, it really needs to be the package that best suits the risks for that particular business. And you mentioned the, the hospitality sector. And obviously, as a business where they get a lot of footfall, as a business where there is, there is food involved, um, there are a number of additional risks there. Um, so those businesses should be getting, as I say, not necessarily the cheapest, but they should be getting good value in terms of the products that they're taking out in the market because of that level of competition and the advice that they're receiving. But in terms of premium data, I'm afraid I don't have that. Okay. In relation to uh, the, the points made by the Chair, the evidence we've got here it talks about the wording states that the disease must have manifested itself at the premises. Mm. Is that strictly the case? Uh, that that has to be, there has to be evidence of that before a, a payout would be even considered. I, I mean, as I did say at the start, I'm not able to comment on individual insurance contracts. I don't have access to that policy wording, or I'm not able to speak on behalf of the, the individual firm. That would be a matter for the, the insurer to, to answer and discuss with you, I'm afraid. Um, so I, I'm a little bit inside of what, what, what isn't altogether clear to me is whether that policy had uh, an additional level of cover for either infectious disease or pandemic uh, and whether that is what the business is, is, is claiming on. I don't know if, that, if, if, if you're able to, to check that or to, to clarify that. I understand it covered notifiable diseases. Right, so, so there is a clause in there for notifiable disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the last point then, are, are new policies available then that would cover the pandemic? understand from the evidence that one of the businesses had, couldn't get, even get a new a policy, and they were going for renewal and they couldn't get it. Is that the case, that, that they, you still wouldn't get cover for, to cover the pandemic or the future risks in the future in the, that may come up? Well, I, I mean, again, it's up to individual firms to decide their own commercial terms and the risks that they will write and they won't write. But what, the point I would make in general is if you go back to kind of first principles, insurance is all about managing the risk of various possible um, incidents, in this case, various possible disruptions to a business. Now, if that possibility becomes a probability, as, as, as is in the case of COVID-19 in terms of the, the measures that we've had to take and the potential for it to, to break out, 
then it's likely to increase the premium substantially in light of the increased likelihood of a claim coming through at some point or else be excluded from the policy which would make the policy more affordable for the businesses to buy and cover against the other risks such as fire or flood or other damages uh, or, or interruption to the business carried out at the, the premises. Um, but it, it possibly would not include uh, cover for COVID-19. Okay, thanks very much. I can just re-emphasise what has been said. There's a lot of disappointment, a lot of anger, annoyance out there amongst yeah. businesses that they felt that the insurance policy was in place and when they Mm -hmm. They go to contact their broker and follow up that it's, it doesn't, and I think it's most disappointing and unfortunate. But I suppose to the ordinary man on the street, it's not, it's not unusual from insurers. But thank you for your contribution. And no, you're welcome. I, I, I would just say, if I may, that I can recognise what you've said there, because I've had a number of conversations on, on a weekly, sometimes on a daily basis, with businesses in, in that similar situation. So I've had first-hand experience of the concerns and the issues and, the, and, and the, the tribulations that they're facing. So I absolutely appreciate the point that you've made. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Cher. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Alistair, just can I come back in around the, the amount of, of premiums that are, are likely to be paid out this year? Um, and you have highlighted you know, some of the increased payout in terms of travel insurance and also in terms of business interruption and other types of insurances. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so uh, it's going to be considerably more perhaps than normal um, and I'm just looking here uh, at the, the state of the market report which indicates that there's like almost 90 billion of premiums paid in a, in a year um, so mm -hmm. in comparison to what's paid in and what's paid out there is a, a huge um, I suppose discrepancy there you know in terms so if I suppose it's difficult for people to get their head around why the uh, premiums can't be paid out considering the huge amounts that are paid in so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where you're getting this £90 billion figure from, Chair. Is that purely in relation to business interruption policies? Oh, it's in, it's in your State of the Market report. The UK general insurance market wrote £88.8 .8 billion of premiums. Yeah. But I, I, I think that would then refer, relate back to the, the point that I made earlier, that you know, insurers reserve capital on the basis of the risk that they've taken on board and, and charge a premium accordingly. And I think that £90 billion figure would cover other business insurances, whether it's uh, motor insurance for fleets, uh, employer liability, public liability. I, as far as I'm aware, I've, I've not got it in front of me, but I don't think that £90 billion figure relates specifically to business interruption insurance. But if it does, I'll, I'll happily um, come back to the committee in writing and, and, and clarify that. Um, but as I say, it, it comes back to this point that insurers will make financial reservations against you know, all these potential risks that they've, they've, they've underwritten. And they will set aside money and that is um, protected and that is preserved under you know, pretty stringent European Union regulations regarding the solvency ins of insurers. And the solvency of insurers remains very, very robust. And that gives reassurance to, to, to the whole system. But they will, they will make reservations based on the risks that they've undertaken. Now, if, if what you're looking for them to do is to pay out for risks that they have not underwritten, they've not made financial reservations for, that then really starts to stretch the whole, uh, the, the whole um, solvency of the, the entire insurance system. Um, and as I say, in terms of that £90 billion figure, that will take into account other policies which money has been reserved for against those ones. So it's not really the case that you could take... Uh, premiums or funds that have been reserved against employer liability claims and pay them out on business interruption insurance because those same employer liability claims might then fall due and require to be paid. So I suppose it is really saying that we can't pay out on a, a risk because the risk was greater than what we thought it was going to be when we made the um, insurance policy? No, 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 that's what I'm saying. No, insurers will pay out on the risks that they have underwritten. So if you, if, you, if, you know, if you are running a business and you have identified perhaps you have high value stock that could be stolen or perhaps you're storing flammable and hazardous materials that in increase the fire risk, you will, you, that will be reflected in the premium that you've paid and you will get cover for that. But if you are then wanting to um, claim for incidents or, or, or damage caused above and beyond that, then, then that's where you, you, you get the, uh, the tension in the system, if you like. 
Yeah, and I suppose it goes back then to Gordon's point about future um, insurance policies and um, getting the actual cover that businesses might want. Um, and when they mm -hmm. reflect upon this experience, um, where it seems the hoops have been jumped through to avoid paying out, it, it's not going to instill a great deal of confidence. Um, John Stewart, sorry, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Alistair, for uh, your contribution so far. I think uh, we'll probably not get off this subject much this morning. Um, the Chair's points are very well made, as are Gordon's. But I am getting dozens of businesses who have been raising this issue with me, and I appreciate what you say about the detail of the policy and what it should, or what maybe people thought they were getting versus what the insurance company was underwriting. But when you've got policies not paying out or refusing to pay out and wanting to go to court, when they have business interruption insurance in place with zero exclusions, and then they're being told, no, you would have had to have taken something else on top of that, that's nonsensical. It's actually a disgrace. If someone takes out a policy and it says no exclusions, then there are no exclusions. There can't be. And I have companies contacting me to say that their broker is telling them they're eligible for a claim but that the insurance company on the writer is taking it to court. Yet, meanwhile, they're still being expected to pay their premiums, which will no doubt go up at the end of this. And, um, like, I appreciate you telling me what you're paying out on travel insurance and everything else, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. You're in the game, you're in the insurance business. I'm sorry, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll be flush. Most of the time, sometimes you have to pay out. But, like, no doubt, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's not as many claims at the minute on car insurance because nobody's driving or on um, home insurance because everybody's in the house, you know. Look, that is the nature of the beast, but you can't tell me that the reputation of insurance companies is going to go up in the back of this when people are losing their companies because they're not getting paid out on insurance policies they thought they were getting. And when the brokers tell them they're entitled to it and the insurance companies say no, I think we're in serious difficulties. Your, your, your points are very well made. I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't think I have been suggesting anything about the, the insurance industry's reputation. Um, and, and appreciate the points that you've made. I mean, if you are getting these constituency cases coming through, if, if I can help and assist with them, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. that. That's part of my role. That's, that's part of my job. Um, insurers are, as I say, supportive of the FCA's legal action because rather than people taking individual actions, and as I said earlier, that process taking several months or years, what we've got is a situation where there are going to, there's going to be a test case raised by the, the FCA or, or a number of test cases and the various different policy wordings are testing out. And, and that's going to give everyone clarity. But to, to return to, to the point that made previously, um, you know, business interruption is about specific risks to the premises. Um, so when you're saying there are, there are zero exemptions or exclusions, it would be really helpful to understand what level of cover those businesses have bought. Have they bought standard business interruption cover, which, you know, as I said earlier, specifies uh, risks to the property for fire and flood and everything else, or, or, or if it is other levels. I mean, it's, it's perhaps something that's easier to, to, to discuss in more detail outside of this meeting. I'm very, very happy to do that. Um, I mean, you, you, your points on, on other insurance lines are well made, and the, the position we've got there. I would, I, would, I would just probably say that in relation to home insurance, with everybody being locked down and predominantly spending time in their houses, yep, that will reduce some risks, but that could put up others in terms of accidental damage. You mentioned the, uh, the fall in, in road use, and that's absolutely correct. Um, initially, road use went down substantially. I think we've seen that back up now and certainly the indications from the Northern Ireland Executive and from other governments elsewhere in the UK is that traffic and, and, and travel are, are ticking up again. Um, I mean, on, on that point, motor insurance is a statutory requirement. You have to have it if you've got a car unless you're going to apply for a statutory off-road notification, the, the SOR notification, which means your car's not being used at all and you can take it off the road. If you're not driving, or if you're certainly not driving as much as you were previously, you still need insurance for protection against vandalism or accidental damage or theft, and you still need to have that as a legal requirement on your vehicle. Now, some insurers have started to look at that and offer refunds um, on, on parts of the policy, but the policy isn't just based on the number of miles that you're doing and the likelihood of having an accident. There are, there are various other factors and elements to that. Um, and again, I can write to the committee if that would be helpful to, to, to break down the, the various costs within a policy 
and how that's built up. But I, I absolutely appreciate the point that you make that some, some insurances are mandatory, whether it's for individuals or whether it's for businesses, and others can be bought on a discretionary basis. And I absolutely recognise what you're saying in terms of the, the market going forward, businesses' appetite to, to buy those kind of products, the, the pricing and the affordability of those products going forward, and what they will and won't be able to cover. What, the, the final point I would make is that all, all these products are quite dynamic, so they're reflecting the circumstances of individual businesses and also the position of the overall economy. Um, and insurers are working really hard to understand what that's looking like going forward, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, or whatever. Um, businesses are continuing to pay out, uh, uh, sorry, not pay out, businesses are continuing to pay in and, and pay their insurance premiums. Um, and that's important because they still need to maintain the cover um, that they've bought for, for their business, for their employees, you know, for, in terms of public liability, to protect any customers that they, they, they may have in store if they are at the moment, you know, a, a food retailer or a large other retail business as they start to reopen as well. Okay, thank you for that update. I mean, I, I, I just, I think there'll be a lot of people, businesses, um, others, paying these policies. People just see the insurance companies coming out on top, as always, um, the one time they were needed. Because let's face it, no one likes claiming their insurance, given the costs, unless it's really vital. Uh, the one time it's needed, they're going to get shafted, and that's the way it feels, to be quite honest. But uh, I appreciate your points, Mr. Allen, and we will bring some directly to you. If I could raise one sector in particular, mm -hmm. um, and that is the childcare sector. Um, I'm getting many childcare providers who are saying to me that they have been told that their the public liability insurance and their insurance premiums, uh, their insurance policies are no longer valid. Those again who were covered for this are finding they're not being covered because of the ambiguity around wording, and now they're either not able to get a policy to reopen to start providing the essential um, economy support that they provide, or else that the premiums are rocketing to unprecedented um, levels. Is there anything that you as a sector could do about that, given how important the childcare sector plays in our economy? No, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that was one of the points that the, the clerks had raised in advance. I'm grateful to that, that notice because we were able to, to go back to colleagues and to members and, and to consult them on this. So, so speaking generally, initially in terms of employer liability and public liability, employer liability is one of the mandatory insurances that I mentioned earlier, public liability not so. Um, but as businesses start to reopen, they need to ensure that they're following suitable government and health and safety executive guidance. Uh, many insurers are providing their own sector-specific guidance to help businesses reopen. Um, you know, I have to be honest, there, there, there is some nervousness in the market from insurers in respect to some of the high-risk sectors um, and you know, the importance of businesses having strict processes for ensuring that their customers, their employees um, are, are, are safe. The, the market is still understanding this new level of risk and, 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 and is responding to that. But as far as I'm aware, and we checked this you know, at the end of last week, uh, as far as we're cover is still available uh, for, for renewals or, or, or open to new business. Um, but it's, it's, we're in a position where I think businesses are, are being asked to provide significant additional levels of information on their business, on the type of risk that they face and how they operate. The, 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 the best advice I can give in that situation is the more information you're able to share with your insurer, the better the insurer will be able to understand the risks present in your business that could result in a public liability claim and and offer a product and, and price that accordingly. Um, I mean, there are, there are other factors at play here, um, more with employer liability than, than public liability, but I think there is concern that you know, there could be claims farming goes on um, and what's known as claims management companies could be targeting people to encourage them to bring COVID-19 claims in the same ways in, in the past they've encouraged them to bring claims for holiday sickness or, or claims for whiplash and other minor road traffic injuries uh, and that could potentially put significant pressure on the system and also from the insurance company's point of view the future availability of reinsurance so are they able to reinsure the risks that they're taking on in order to manage that financial risk in, in relation specifically to child care this has been one that was raised specifically at the, at, at the start of, of, of the lockdown period and, and how that applied then and continues to be one that's it's a high priority one another high priority sectors, as you might expect, is the position in care homes. Um, I think the situation in Northern Ireland hasn't been as extreme as certainly the situation we've seen in Scotland, but concerns about both employer liability and public liability in, in those kind of environments. And businesses will need assurance that their 
public and employer liability policies, we will be providing the sufficient cover to enable them to reopen for trading and, and managing the health and safety risks um, that, that they're going to be facing. So as I say, the, the market remains open for renewals, for extensions of existing policies and, and for new businesses. Insurers are taking different commercial approaches to the market, um, but as, as far as we've been told, cover is still available. So if, if that's not the case, please do get in touch and please do write to me. Okay. Thank you very much, Alistair. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alistair. Um, so just to, to pick up on, you mentioned there in response to John about businesses continuing to pay premiums and, and they need to continue paying premiums for employers and, and public liability insurance. Um, and one of the other things that was highlighted to us by Enterprise NI was that there's a growing concern that businesses will look to make savings by not paying, for example, inter business interruption or stock or contents or even premises insurance. Um, and that there is a danger then that many businesses could end up dangerously exposed to risk without cover, uh, which would be mm -hmm. you know, a real concern. Um, the, the, the lack of confidence, I suppose, is, is contributing to that. Um, has the insurance industry been trying to reach out and, um, I don't know, set up forums for discussion or you know, try to, to uh, reinstill some confidence in, in the system in relation to all of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, as, as I say, I was speaking to Michael McQuillan last week. Um, we've been in touch with, you know, the various organisations, the, the CBI Northern Ireland, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Institute of Directors, the Chamber of Commerce, um, keeping them advised and, 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 and making offers to, to brief them, to brief the member companies, to discuss things like this. I mean, the, the problem that you've highlighted, Chair, is a really significant one because if businesses only buy the insurance that they have to by law, so as I say, things like employer liability or motor policies if they operate a vehicle fleet, mm -hmm. if they only buy the insurances they absolutely have to under law, um, there's a risk that they are what's known as underinsured. So if they were to suffer a fire at the premises and they lost uh, all, all their high-value stock and didn't have insurance cover for that, that, that would um, you know, compound the, the situation even further. I mean, I appreciate the committee's focus is on business interruption insurance and the payouts or the lack of payouts uh, in that particular area. But, I, you know, as I said earlier, insurers pay out. That's what they do. They take on risk on behalf of their, their, their insureds. They make financial reservation to pay out if those, if those fall due, and they do pay out. As I say, you know, nearly $8 billion paid in, in business interruption policies alone last year. What we're talking about here is a very specific situation in relation to COVID-19, which is entirely unanticipated. Um, I don't know about anybody else. I really struggle to uh, avoid using the word unprecedented, but it was un unanticipated. So, you know, six seven months ago, we weren't aware at all of the existence of um, coronavirus and COVID-19. Far less have been able to take that into account in the insurance policies that people are now trying to claim on. So, you know, I return to the point I made earlier. If insurers had been aware of coronavirus and COVID-19 and had incorporated that into policies, they've been able then to reserve sufficient capital to pay out if, uh, if cover was available. They've done that in the policies that have extended to pandemic cover. And those, as I said earlier, those should be getting paid out and they should be getting paid out as quickly as possible. Um, but the, 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 the challenging situation is, is just what I've laid out here. Yeah, just again, to pick up on, on one of John's points where the broker was saying that they should be paid out and the insurance company is saying that they shouldn't. Um, I'm not sure what the, the exact circumstances is there, but in the, the FCA's um, guidance to insurers, they say it's important that claims are assessed and settled quickly using interim payments where appropriate. Are you aware of um, companies that are even doing that in relation to some of these claims where there may be, I don't know, some ambiguity around uh, particular wording or, or whatever? You know, is there even an effort to make some sort of payment to companies if they are trying to make the case that you know that, that there isn't full liability because it wasn't foreseen um, when the policy was being written? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said at the start, I can't comment in the individual insurance contracts, or I can't speak on behalf of a particular firm. You need to to invite them to appear and to, and to go into that level of detail with you. But absolutely, firms are, are taking different approaches. They're looking really hard at this. They are they're acutely conscious that. You know, businesses are looking for them to support, and they continue to support these businesses in as many different ways as they can. And you know, I mentioned earlier some of the extensions and additions to policy. If you look at 
businesses where they have premises that are now unoccupied and could be at a higher risk, whether that's from theft or escape of water or fire. Uh, insurers have gone above and beyond, so they've provided advice to their insureds, to their customers, on what uh, measures they can take, you know, the kind of things that they should be doing and should be checking. Um, obviously, most people have been unable to travel to their premises until now, as we see the restrictions start to, to relax. But one helpful thing has been that the security industry has been certified as a, an essential or a key worker, um, performing an essential role. And so security firms have been able to go into premises to, to carry out the basic checks to make sure the place is secure, whether it's from theft or from escape of water or, or other perils and risks like that. In, in terms of policies, insurers have said, you know, normally you would have to visit a premises once within 30 days in order to maintain your insurance cover. That's been extended to recognise the, the circumstances that we're in now. And, and insurers really are trying as hard as they can to support their customers in the way they can, because, you know, as you noted, um, we will still be hoping that firms will, will purchase insurance, will have confidence in the system. As I say, insurers are paying out on, on other claims, but business interruption is, is going to be a big, big factor. So insurers are working really hard, as hard as they can, to support their customers where they're able to do so. But, you know, to return to the point I made right at the start, you know, in a business interruption insurance where the vast majority of policies haven't covered a pandemic situation, insurers aren't going to be able to pay out. We'll see what the FCA court action brings in terms of a decision from the court, and then insurers will, will, will abide by that and, and proceed on the back of that. Yeah. And I suppose what we're, you've highlighted some of the areas there where risks may increase, but also there are other risks that those businesses um, would be insured against that will be decreased and so that will offset the increase in, in the risks. For example, you know, there aren't people on the premises, so there isn't likely to be injuries or, or things like that. Um, so, you know, one kind of offsets the other in respect of that. Um, Gary, mm -hmm. can I bring you in there? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Alistair, for um, coming along today uh, or dining into the call. Um, obviously, you can hear uh, the frustration of, of members, and, and certainly our frustration is just a small proportion of those uh, of the frustration that's been faced by businesses. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Um, w w one of the businesses w which had contacted myself, well, and I know that uh, you've contacted the committee as well, it, 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 you mentioned the fact that they, they were effectively forced to close or told to close uh, by the government. Um, they didn't have any um, coronavirus cases within their premises because they worked very, very hard to ensure that that wasn't the case. Uh, however, they have been told by their insurance provider that uh, had there been somebody with, with coronavirus in the premises, then, then they would have uh, they would have got a payout. Now, to me and, and to that business, you know, that sounds deeply unfair, given the fact that they almost have been punished for the fact that they didn't have uh, coronavirus in their premises. And I appreciate uh, what you've been saying, Alistair, in terms of you can't get into specific uh, details, but in the broad, this seems to be a common theme. So, you know, what recourse do these people have? Um, you, know, you, you touch on the fact that the FCA will, will, make, a, will make a ruling, but the, you know, the, the fact is people don't, or these businesses don't have weeks. Uh, they've been fighting for weeks to get an insurance payout. Uh, and we're now sitting at a point where they still can't get a period and they're actually facing closure. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I can understand exactly that kind of situation where businesses have followed the advice from the UK government um, and, and done what they've been asked to do. Um, and, you know, certainly nobody wants to have coronavirus in their business or on their premises. You know, I absolutely don't want to have that. Um, you know, regardless whether you're able to make an insurance claim on it or, or, or not, you know, it's a situation you just would not want to be in. In, in terms of recourse, if, if businesses have sought uh, a claim and raised a claim with an insurer and that's something paid out and they feel they've been treated unfairly, as I think you're suggesting, the, the, there's two steps that they should be taking or they can take, certainly. The first is to raise a complaint through the insurer's own complaints process. Um, and, and I know some businesses certainly have already gone down that road and, and that's in hand. If at the end of that, the outcome isn't one that satisfies, <coughs> excuse me, that satisfies the, uh, the, the business, they've got the option to take it to the Financial Ombudsman Service, which again can review the insurer's handling of the claim and, and, and consider that and then come back with, it with a judgment. So there are other options available. As I say, some businesses have already gone down those routes. The 
the advantage that the FCA's legal action offers, and the, the FCA set out the timetable for that last Monday, and the anticipation is that it would come, would come to call in court in the second half of next month, in the second half of July, and be considered then. Um, the, the advantage of that is that it's going to take weeks rather than months and is going to give at least that level of clarity that I, I mentioned earlier. But I, I absolutely appreciate this. Is, it's fundamentally, when you strip everything else away, this is a cash flow issue and businesses have had zero or no cash flow since early March. You know, we're now in, we're now in June. This is an absolutely challenging circumstance. I can, I, I can understand and appreciate that. As I say, if, they, if they're unhappy with the way that their insurers handled the claim, they have those two options, as I mentioned, to go through either the complaint, well, firstly, rather, to go through the complaints um, process that an individual insurer has, and then if they're still not satisfied, to take that to the financial ombudsman service. Mm. Okay, and, and in terms of, you know, speaking from my own constituency perspective, you know, for many businesses, this is a case of deja vu. Because uh, if we recall, in, in, in August of 2017, there were severe floods which destroyed so many businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, uh, those businesses had much the same issues when they were dealing with their insurance providers. Um, but, you know, there's a perception, and I think it's, it's probably gone beyond uh, just a perception at this point, that there's many insurance companies who, when, when it comes to um, a claim coming forward, that they interpret themselves, each of the clauses, what suits best their, their, their own benefit, uh, whereas, as I say, and, and you know, those clauses may not have been uh, clearly set out in terms of what they what they had meant, but they, the insurance companies will suit it to, to meet their own their own benefit. And I think that's something that's really concerning at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I recognise your, your concerns absolutely, but that's perception versus the reality, and the reality is that insurers pay out on the the vast majority of the claims that are, are received where they are valid claims, where, where people have bought the level of cover that enables the insurer to pay out. They, they are doing that, they have done that, and, and they'll continue to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the, the, the cases that you mentioned, more on kind of domestic properties rather than businesses that were flooded back in August of 2017. And, you know, I've, I've taken part in events that have been organised by the Department of Infrastructure um, over in Londonderry that have you know, put us in touch with some of the people that have been affected there, and we've done our best to help and advise them and and and, uh, and help them through the process there. Um, but as I say, you know, the, the, the perception element, I understand what you're saying to an extent that that's, that, that, that's beyond a remit and control, but insurers are, are working flat out at the moment to, to meet claims, whether it's for the floods that I mentioned earlier, whether it's for, for valid insurance claims, and all the other insurance lines that are, are still paying out unaffected by, by the COVID-19 situation. Um, but, you know, it, it's really important for us to demonstrate confidence in the insurance system, so I, I, I appreciate the points that you've made. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Alistair, I know you have to go shortly, so um, look, thank you for joining us this morning. Obviously, I think you, you'll recognise the, the level of frustration that we were all um, having as, as public representatives um, and reflecting the concerns of businesses that have come to us um, and some of them in the worst hit um, sectors of this crisis and in particular the likes of hospitality and childcare. Um, and there is a real, real concern there um, going forward as well as to um, the level of cover that businesses are going to have. Obviously, the in terms of the, the wider economy, um, you know, everybody has stepped up in terms of um, mitigations, including the banking institutions and others. And it, is, it just seems that the the insurance is the one institution that isn't really playing ball in it all. And it's and it it really is um, a, a bone of contention, as I suppose, amongst all of those that we we are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and I would really just urge um, that. That message is heard very clearly by the industry and that hopefully the, the action that's been taken by the FCA will clarify it for some people, if not for, for all. Mm -hmm. No, I'd, 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 I'd take those points in board chair and I will pass these concerns back to the ABI and, and to its member firms. We are very aware of the strength of feeling in Northern Ireland and, and elsewhere across the country uh, from from... MLAs from MPs from MSPs and from others. What, what I would say, if I may, is that we've we've spent 
the, the majority of the time today looking at business interruption insurance. I mentioned earlier some of the measures insurers have taken to support their customers, whether it's on motor or home insurance policies, on business policies in relation to other aspects such as you know um, unoccupied properties. In, insurers are stepping up. I mean, to give you one example, last week we agreed the trade credit reinsurance um, scheme that you, you mentioned in your introduction. Now, just, just to put that in context, in trade credit insurance underwrites an estimated $350 billion of economic activity uh, in the UK across about 630,000 or so businesses. Uh, and this is where it ensures suppliers selling goods against the company they are selling to defaulting on payment or, or delaying on payment. And it gives businesses the, the, the confidence to trade with one another. Now, in Northern Ireland, that market's worth around there's about £4 billion worth of trade credit insurance covering the market at the moment. And it's supporting a number of firms, particularly in the manufacturing sectors, and also firms that are doing business with the Republic of Ireland. And there's a, a, a Brexit element to that as well, which is important for trade credit. But we've gone from a position where at the start of April there was huge pressure on the market to one where we've managed to reach agreement with the UK Treasury and the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for a scheme to the, to the value of £10 billion to maintain cover in the market so that insurers can keep on um, writing policies supporting businesses. Now, this is something that's been welcomed by the Federation of Small Businesses. It's been welcomed by the CBI, the Institute of Directors, and by Enterprise NI as particularly important to Northern Ireland's economy in relation to the agri-food sector and also to you know, various manufacturing businesses that are, are struggling right now with COVID-19 and with other circumstances. So I, I would put that forward as an, you know, some illustrations of where the industry is stepping up. We're certainly not being quiet. We've worked incredibly hard, and our members have worked incredibly hard to get to a point where we can maintain trade, trade credit insurance in the market. Um, I appreciate the frustrations on business interruption insurance in particular. Um, as we say, hopefully the, the FCA test case will provide clarity on that and we can move forward after that. But I don't think it's a fair description to say that the, the insurance industry is not being active, is not stepping up you know, for, the, for the reasons I've just set out. Well, thank you very much for being with us this morning um, and it was useful for members to, to have the opportunity to put the concerns forward. Thanks Alistair. You're welcome. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Chair, thank you. as suggested, um, if members are content that we forward on everything that we have. Um, we've done a, an exercise to ask um, our colleagues in, in umbrella groups covering many businesses to set out the examples that they have, many of which have been brought up already. So if members are content, we, yeah. we go ahead and do that. And Alistair has said that he will look at those. Um, I, I can only express frustration again. Um, I think, you know, yeah. if you're a, a business owner listening to, to that, I, I think it's very difficult to, to comprehend um, the, the lack of cover. Chair, I suppose um, the further issue is although the FCA review will be a lot faster than High Court action, it's still going to be probably August before that um, plays out. And that's, you know, another six, eight, seven, whatever weeks. And I, I think from what we've heard, a lot of businesses um, Generally, we'll have, and if they're fortunate, we'll have reserves for three months, and that three months pretty much ends in the next couple of weeks. Um, so it may well be too late for a lot of businesses, and I don't know how that works retrospectively. Um, I suppose we'll have to keep uh, following the FCA, actually, see how, how that will ultimately benefit people. Um, we have been in touch with the FCA. With the legal action that's going on with this review, there isn't really it's not necessarily appropriate to come in and deal with the issues. Yeah, no, not in respect to that, but perhaps sharing this information with them. Also. Sure, absolutely. Um, if members are content, then we will forward on all that we've gathered to the FCA as well as to the ABI. Because right, I know that they were looking for, um, they have issued a consultation, so it will be useful. And perhaps if there are examples of insurance contracts that um, businesses want to share some, with us. Yeah, we do have some. Um, that we can share those. We put out another call, Chair, yeah. for that, and then we forward everything on. Particularly in relation to the pandemic cover yeah. and the infectious disease cover. Yeah, Chair, I think the, the information that has been brought has been good, and thanks for that, Peter, and your staff. 
and any other details you have, I think we should send them on as proposed. The other point I would make is just we are all trying to encourage the reopening of businesses, and I suppose um, the risk of COVID is still there, still exists. So how are these businesses covered with insurance moving forward? I suppose um, I thought about raising that today again, but we didn't really get a lot of answers at all. We got a lot of repetition, I think, and with disappointment that, they, that there was no clear answers. But a, a lot of it is being defensive, I suppose, and there's there are a number of issues uh, and with the court cases ongoing and, yeah. and so on and so forth. So they're they're unwilling to take liability. So uh, it's just that is a bit of a worry, you know, for a business going forward. Uh, on the answer of whether he could give insurance cover or could get insurance cover would now cover pandemic. I don't believe it, it is now forthcoming either. So businesses are being left um, in the lurch and with uncertainty and unclear in relation to the, the way forward on insurance. So we must keep the pressure on and try to do what we can. We appreciate what has been done to date by, by yourselves and others. Chair, as I say, everything we forward, we'll expect a response on, and it, it's probably worth um, adding in to what we're sending, the, the, the question, just exactly how businesses will be situated in terms of insurance going forward. If they are starting to reopen, you know, that's... how are they being insured? They have to have insurance, as, as members have said. Um, the, the fear is that they will go for the minimum legally required cover, and as, as Mr Ross himself is pointing out, that really will not serve them particularly well. But at the same time, they're unable to insure themselves um, against these issues. And as Mr Dunn said, they're actually now finding, finding difficulty in renewing insurance that's already there that would, be, would provide cover for all of yeah. this. So it's, it's, it seems to be for business to actually finding some insurance to cover them and going forward seems to be complicated we'll try and pin down all these issues and see if we can get responses and in relation to the points that john was making around childcare, that, that that's a yeah. particular concern um and i know the, the the department of health had um, provided some comfort in terms of that and i'm not sure that was supposed to end at the end of june where that if that's being extended as well Chair, i suppose that's one of the other issues that that Will will probably beg consideration is um, where departments are able to step in. I suppose to an extent that's been the the supports that have already been provided, the additional support that's hopefully going to be coming um, as a result of the monitoring round or whatever else. Um, Chair, if members are content, we'll we'll write to the health minister and just ask what the position is on that. Yeah, please. Um, just for clarification, because um, it would be useful to Given find the, out. The, the integral role that childcare will have it's for businesses it'll be necessary them. to reopen yeah absolutely um thank you members if we go ahead and do those then okay you need a sentence comment there yeah much in line with what we're saying in Yeah, a lot, Chair, a lot seems to depend really on how this FCA yeah. review or action goes. Um, but we probably aren't looking at an outcome for that until well into the summer. Um, and in the meantime, we don't really have an idea of how people's insurance is going to work. So we try and pin down as much as we possibly can. Um, but it, it's, it seems that the... I think the, the phrase was the market's evolving. So we'll yeah. we look to see what we what we have there. Um, okay. Okay. Well um thank you members for that and um any other business? No I understand that it's been flagged. Oh, the minister's coming to ad hoc meeting on Thursday. on Thursday. Yes, Chair. Um Minister's scheduled in for Thursday. I I've asked the department if it's anything specific rather than um the the ruling sort of update they they're going to get back to me on that so if i hear anything i flag up to members in the meantime half one i think yeah um they, they started earlier i think now um i haven't seen a uh 
a running order yet for members or for ministers' questions, which are going to be reinstated. Um, I th I'm assuming yeah, next from week, one um, or next week. And I think it's executive office in Dira, isn't it next okay. week? So. Okay. Well, we'll see if we can a, get the order on that one as well. Forward. There will be. No, there will be. I'll, I'll check up on that and see when the economy minister's there. And obviously, we the minister confirmed for next Wednesday next week, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the date time and place of the next week meeting is tomorrow morning here in room 30, um, when we will have a briefing from the further education sector. Just to flag up members before they go, it will still be dial-in. We, we aren't able to, to utilise Starlink tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern